session of the Indian and the Spanish speaking diplomacy, conversions, conversations with diplomats in the time of the coronavirus. As I said earlier, we are proposing a series of webinars by diplomats from Spanish speaking countries. The aim is to know the background of diplomatic relations between India and the Hispanic world, the present state, the future expectations, and the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. As I said the other day, and I would like to repeat these numbers here because I think they are really important, why India and the Spanish-speaking diplomacy? Let me remind you that the number of Spanish speakers now stands at 58 crores, and there are 21 Spanish-speaking countries. Spanish is the second language in terms of native speakers after Chinese and the third language in total number of speakers after English and Chinese. 7.6% of the world population speaks Spanish. It is the second language of international communication and the second language in Facebook, LinkedIn and Twitter. 6.9% of the GDP of the world belongs to Spanish-speaking people, and the purchasing power of the Hispanic community is almost 10% of the world of the GDP. Another thing very interesting is the growth of Spanish in India, and let me remind you that in 2005, the number of uh, students of Spanish at Indian University was of 1,500, in 2011, it increased to 4,250. And in 2019, it, it is more than 7,800. So in this context, I'm really happy to have today ambassador from Spain. And I am really grateful to him to take some of his time from his very busy schedule, even in spite of the coronavirus. Tele, um, working at, at home sometimes it's even more taxing than working. So I thanks very much, Mr. Barañano. And I would just like to introduce, because we, are, we have with us a very senior diplomat from the Spanish Foreign Service. He has more than 40 years of experience as a career diplomat since he joined the diplomatic service in 1978. He had the position of commercial commercial counselor at the Spanish embassy in countries like Ecuador, Austria, and Morocco. He's been also the deputy director general for bilateral economic relations at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Madrid. As uh, the, with the rank of ambassador, he was ambassador to Australia, New Zealand, Papua New Guinea, and, and some of the Pacific Islands. In 2005, he was Inspector General of Service at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Madrid. He's been later Ambassador of Spain to Malaysia in Brunei, Senior Consular at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Directorate General of North America and Asia. And before coming to India, he was Ambassador at Large for International and Environmental Affairs at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Madrid. Since 2097, he is ambassador of Spain to India, Bhutan, Nepal, Maldives, and Sri Lanka. So thank you very much. Really, I'm, I, I am very happy to be able to do this session today with you. And especially in these trying times of the, of the coronavirus. I would like you to start, you know, by asking you, how old, how old are the relation, diplomatic relations between India and Spain? So, back to you, Ambassador. Oh, I don't, can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much, uh, Oscar. Thank you very much for this invitation to speak. Thank you very much for all the viewers that are attending this session. And I will start just by answering your first question. Uh, and I will start with something which is uh, uh, surprising, which is a small piece of history that uh, probably is not known. 
and it it said uh, that in 15, uh, 1581, uh, Spain and Portugal were just one nation under the King Philip II. And uh, in 1992, then uh, sorry, in 1592, the Sp this King of Spain was also King of the Portuguese uh, state of India. Uh, and so uh, at that time, one year later, 19, sorry, 1592, the, uh, the, the Sultan or the Pasha of the Mughals, Akbar, uh, wrote a letter to the Spanish king and another letter to the Pope. Both letters are in the Spanish uh, National Library. Uh, announcing that he was sending an ambassador to Spain and another one to Rome. Uh, this was, I tell you exactly, it was uh, uh, 438 years ago. Mm -hmm. I, I'm still there? Yes, yeah. yes, that's very interesting, Ambassador, that you just mentioned. Oh, this, yeah. this piece of yeah. history, because so I think very, very few people know about that. And, and, and I, it's really a, a very so, special uh, kind of information. You, if you tell me since, since when uh, we have relations, since 438 years, or th 38 years, which is something okay. significant. But coming to the present, uh, if we speak about the Republic of India and after independence in, in 1947, it was only in 1956 uh, when both countries agreed to establish diplomatic relations. Uh, you have to take into account that till 1955, Spain was not member of the United Nations. So it was just the year after. The year after. And uh, the first uh, Spanish ambassador came to India in 1958, and the first Indian ambassador to Spain uh, came in, in 1965, and uh, the, Sp the first Indian ambassador was uh, the Maharaja of Jaipur, Man Singh II. Mm -hmm. So that's the history of our relations. Mm -hmm. That's very good. Let me share also an anecdote with you. You know, a very interesting piece of information is that when Vasco de Gama landed in, 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 in Kerala, in Calicut, the first day, he met a, a Moor from North Africa who was speaking the clear language of Castilla. So it means that <laughs> Spanish was already spoken at the time when the Portuguese came here, which is, a, it's, it's mentioned in Os Luciadas, you know, which is a very interesting thing. And it just goes about what you are saying, that our relations are much older than we may suspect. Yes, and in the, in, we had the former president of India, Srimati Pratiba Patil, traveled to Spain in 2009 for the first state visit to Spain by an Indian head of state. Our former king, Juan Carlos I, paid a state visit to India in 2012. His Majesty, uh, Philip VI, visited India as the crown prince on his first official visit in 2009, during which he inaugurated the Cervantes Institute in New Delhi. And the Indian Prime Minister, the present Indian Prime Minister, Sri Narendra Modi, paid an official bilateral visit to Spain in 2017. Could we say that there is a new surge in the last decade in the diplomatic relations between India and Spain? Are there any plans for high-level visits to India from the Spanish authorities? Uh, well, uh, yes to the first question and yes to the second question. <laughs> uh, but allow me to give you a brief uh, overview about the relation of uh, both countries. For many years, uh, for many years, Spain and India have lived in very different worlds. Our hard interest uh, our strategic and economic interests rarely intersected. We lived in different strategic universes. 
As a consequence, contacts were very limited and our communities had little to do with each other. Spain has never been in the first rank of India's international priorities. Of course, India's focus, understandably, has been on its neighborhood, on the region, and with the major powers. Uh, this happens in every community. I mean, uh, if you live in a community of 100 people, uh, you tend to get closer to the neighbors on your, on your floor next or above you or below you and not so much with the rest of the people and not so much with those who live two or three or whatever below. And this exactly happens in the diplomatic relations. Proximity, vicinity plays a very important role on it. And uh, Spain, exactly the same. Uh, Spain uh, has set its main, its main focus in three areas. Europe, the Mediterranean, all the countries around the Mediterranean, and Latin America. Reasons, proximity, culture, language, trade. But the question is that Spain and India have had very, very little relation very, uh, during many, many, many years. So uh, that's why in order to increase the level of our relation, we need to do an extra effort. Uh, and that's what, we've, that's what we have been doing during the last decade, more or less. We had several visits, three visits of the King of Spain, not two visits of the King of Spain, three visits of the Crown Prince, visits of the two visits of the um, President, few ministers have been here because uh, talks at high level are extremely important. As a result of these talks, uh, some positive uh, results have been put in place. First, we have signed an array of agreements that are helping the relations between our people and our companies. Uh, at the same time, the embassy has increased also the diplomatic staff in, in the country in order so to promote better the relation between both countries. So uh, from a very small embassy 10, 15 years ago, now we have not only diplomatic staff, uh, I mean, from the Minister of Foreign Affairs, but we have the Minister of Agriculture, the Minister of Trade, the Ministry of Defense, the Ministry of Industry, we have the Ministry of Tourism, not only in, in, in Delhi, but also in, in, uh, in Mumbai. So it means that we have, we have been making an effort in order to increase the level of uh, um, our relations. Uh, 2017 was a very important year because it was the visit of Prime Minister, Mo uh, Prime Minister Modi that uh, I come to the second part of your, of your question, that what's supposed to be followed by a visit of the Spanish president to uh, India. But as uh, you may know, uh, our political climate in Spain has been very, very complicated during the last four years, three years. We have had three general elections in three consecutive years. We have had a government, an acting government for many months without the possibility of traveling abroad. And this has, uh, th that was uh, the reason why we have to suspend or to cancel or to postpone those meetings till, uh, till just recently. And now we have had the bad luck not only because of the visit, because I mean, uh, the pandemic also has been affecting seriously our relations, as is affecting all the world. And uh, at the moment, uh, there is no visit on the short term, but a visit is due. Mm. Thanks very much. And as, as you say, the, the, I think the pandemic is just altering the, the, the visits here. But you make one a very good point that, that actually history, we had a different history, a separated us. 
but this special effort needs to be done and it's been done during the last decade. And I think it's very different, different fruits, you know, and, 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 and I think there is a big leap, say in the last 10, 20 years in the relations between India and Spain. And I am just echoing here um, a question by one student, Chartered Account, Anil Shankar, which somehow, you know, um, it's talking about, about the relation, international relation between India and Spain and his commitment, commitment to international peace, promotion of free trade, and basic human rights and territorial integrity of the states. So I would like to say, you know, um, how India, there is in this new approach with the relations between India and Spain, do India and Spain share a strong commitment to all these principles of democracy, freedom, rule of law, and promotion of free trade? Uh, absolutely, uh, absolutely. Uh, and. Uh, 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 we look India and Spain eye to eye in many of these international uh, problems that the, the world is facing. Uh, Spain and India have no tension or political problem between us. And Spain is a reliable and natural partner for India in every field, political and economic. We share the same values. And, and when these values uh, uh, guides our approach to international relations, it's much easier to find a common ground. Uh, as you said, both India and Spain support uh, uh, rule-based international order. Uh, and this uh, international order, uh, which is the product of decades of building up global institutions, is today under increasing threat. Its defenders are shrinking and his challenges growing. Uh, since Spain cannot buy or bully its way in this world, a system based on rules and not might is extremely important to us. And we, uh, Spain and India, we are committing to strengthen global non proliferation objectives. We are committed uh, to freedom of navigation and our flights and uh, unimpeded trade and commerce based on the principle of international law. Uh, this, uh, I mean, this, uh, we are, we, we, it's something that uh, we share this uh, uh, vision of a constructive globalization to ensure prosperity. We know that there's things that uh, uh, we can, uh, can, could be improved. But uh, the base of our growth has been there. And uh, there's no point to question all these international organizations. They can be improved, but not removed. And that's, uh, that's what uh, have us together. If you talk about other issues like environment, uh, which is it's a very important subject as well, no? And environment is, is key uh, for the future. And if there is a country where environment is going to be extremely, uh, extremely uh, worrying, that's India. India has almost 20% of the population and just 4% of the world water reserves. And uh, uh, this is not going to improve. And the population is growing and the the uh, wealth of the population is also growing and the consumption is rather is multiplying. So this is something that uh, we have to take very much in mind, everybody uh, in, in, into, into a, a well and effective water management. Without this, uh, we have a lot of fun. Uh, just to give you an idea, the Indian agriculture, uses 75% of the Indian water and only produces 15% of the GDP. <coughs> it's a total lack of efficiency in this area that we can cooperate in order to improve. 
and we can cooperate with India and in, in all those fields where, where we are more or less good, and this is one of them. Well, that's very interesting because I think Spain has gone a, a long way, you know, especially in environment and renewable energies, and there are several companies. And I think that's a very interesting area of collaboration. Ambassador, um, questions are coming. I will try to follow, you know, and, and, and put them along as, as we go and we advance in our, in our session here. I would no like problem. to ask you, yes, please. I will ask, so let's, let's move ahead in the economic relations and commercial relations, you know, because um, there are several questions regarding to, to that, and I will try to put them. But let me first ask you, it is true that there are about 200 Spanish companies in, Spanish companies, companies in India. How are the economic and commercial relations and what are Spain top exports to India and vice versa? Okay. Mm, yes, there are a little bit over 200 com Spanish companies in India, and uh, there are also around 40 Indian companies in Spain. Uh, the numbers are very limited. The numbers are very limited because the bilateral trade between both countries has been very limited for, for, uh, for, for years. But uh, I want just also to say that probably economics remains the core of the India-Spain uh, relationship. But just to tell you, uh, the bilateral trade is around $5 billion, uh, two thirds in favor of India, one third for Spain. But our share is extremely limited in each other uh, trade balances. For example, the Indian, um, uh, we supply only 0.3% of the Indian imports, and India supplies 1.3% of our imports. Uh, but uh, I'm gonna go to a, a very practical way of finding uh, the imbalance of our situation, and the imbalance of our situation in Asia, because it's not only uh, in India. When I refer that we have uh, been away, we have been not only away from India, but we have been also away from Asia for many, many years. So uh, if you divide the Spanish exports, year export by 365, to get how, many, how much we export a day, we come to see that we export to India $4 million a day. Nice. Okay, this is uh, easy to grasp. And then we talk uh, with Russia and we're exporting like $8 million a day. And if we talk about uh, China, it's $16 million a day. So you see one, two, four, this is the ratio there. But that's nothing. Uh, and I will tell you something. Only to Portugal, we export $52 million a day. Twice wow. <laughs> the amount of China, Russia, and India together. So well, but they are our neighbors, no, Ambassador, after all. <laughs> yeah, they, they, are, they are neighbors. But, uh, but it's not economically healthy to have 70% of our trade in Europe and only 10% in the rest of the world. And especially <clears throat> staying out of Asia, which is 40% of the world GDP or 35% and probably also 40 or 50% of the total uh, trade. So uh, this is something that we should be, be doing. And that's why uh, I'm convinced that we have to make a very special effort in places like India, which is a part of COVID, is one of the countries which is going to grow steady during the next 15 years. And not because uh, it's going to do better outside, but basically, basically because the Indian growth mm. is related to the internal demand or inter internal consumption. It's what India consumes, which, which is important, not what India exports. Exports are relatively not, not so big in relation to the internal demand. 
and uh, the growth, the internal growth of, of, of India uh, will be driven, for example, by uh, the rate of urbanization of the largest rural population in the world. There's huge amount of works that need to be done. There is also a lot of possibilities in, in the gradual movement from the informal economy to the formal economy, which is only 10% of the workers in India. Uh, also, the population is important with an average uh, of 27 years is one of the youngest population in, in, in the world. India will have a need a lot of investment infrastructure, infrastructure. All those data gives you the idea that, okay, India is gonna suffer uh, COVID, especially the poorest people in the country, but India will recover and India will keep the path of growth that has been having for the last 10 years or 15 years. Well, that's, that's really, now we see the economist speaking here, ambassador, <laughs> really very interesting. You give also a view of, about the economy in India. And you, I think you partially answered already the question, but I want to put it just, you know, and, and as I said, please, all, all people um, and framing questions, just write their name and the place where they are, from where they are putting the question, because we have people from all over India, even people from Nepal. And I have, I say, I think you partially answered it, but if you want to add something else, this is from our good friend, Professor Anil Vingra, a senior professor, retired professor from, from Nehru University. And he's saying that in spite of high level visits, do you think India and Spain um, um, are not able to reach full potential in their commercial relation? If you compare with other European countries, your opinion, please. I think a very good question. And uh, so that we can <coughs> repeat, we are not reaching our potential, or we cannot. No, full full potential. We are we are still not reaching our full potential in comparison with other European countries. That's what no. the professor is asking. Not not, not at all. Uh, absolutely right. We are far away of, of reaching our uh, potential. Uh, it will need a real effort from the Spanish side, not that much from the Indian side, because uh, as I tell you, uh, the, the, the share of foreign trade in India is quite small compared to the size of the, of the country, of the, of the GDP of the country. In Spain, it's much more important. We, uh, our foreign trade is around 70% of the GDP. India's foreign trade is probably around 40% of the GDP. So uh, for us, uh, trade uh, is essential. Trade in goods and trade in services. And we are the ones who need to make an effort. We came late to India <laughs> and uh, all the seats were taken. I mean, uh, there is, uh, you don't come to a country saying, okay, it's a uh, open, not at all. You have to fight and you have to fight very strong with other competitors, not only from Europe, like Germany or, or the Dutch or, or the French or the Italians, uh, which are strong competitors, but also with the neighbors of India and the ASEAN countries, like Korea, like Japan, like Australia, and all of them are here, and all of them have been here for a long time. And it's very difficult to compete when you have not a, a solid ground. Uh, uh, you compete because your price is better, because your quality is better, or because your service is better. But to provide a service here, you need, you need to have uh, the possibility of having staff and having shops or having, so it's not so easy to get, uh, uh, to provide service for the things that you, you have to rely on, 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 on Indian companies or other. And uh, quality is something that you win, win like, uh, with time, like Germany or, or, or like Japan. But if you compete just in price, there is always in Asia which is going to offer a, a better price than, than yours. So our situation is quite complicated in this field. Uh, the only way is joint ventures, partnership, and finding the right 
in a partner in India. Without the right, without the right partner in India, there is nothing that you can do here. So uh, we have to make an effort. Companies need to make an effort, and we all together have to try to find which are the best partners for the Spanish companies. In India. That's the only way to to move forward. But uh, let me finish with this. Spain shares 2% of the world trade, more or less, 2.1% of the world trade. In India, it's 0.3. So you, 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 you see how much you can grow to reach this level. Oh. <laughs> okay. That's, That's a very interesting point. figure, Ambassador, really. And we have here another question, which is also you are somehow advancing <laughs> advancing the answers, but I, I will just, you only comment it if you wish, but you you also somehow, especially for Asia, no? And this is from Smita Sahay. He's a student of, of the Centro Cervantes in New Delhi. And she's telling as as a trade and commerce partner of India, which European country does Spain see as its close competitor? You have? Uh, okay, uh, which European partner? Uh, Once for each, actually. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I mean, uh, could be uh, the closest to us, but uh, in, uh, it's Italy, but Italy has much better marketing that we are. They are great sellers, the Italians, <laughs> and we are not. No? They so, even selling uh, our oil, no, Ambassador? <laughs> Yes, <laughs> and, and their Italian brands. <laughs> and uh, yeah, they, and, and the, the, main, the main issue in this part of the world uh, is quality and brands. And uh, our brands, we have some good brands, but they are not very well known. No? And uh, uh, so this would be one of them and, and uh, one of the main. We are the seventh, we, we rate seventh among the 27 uh, um, European countries exporting to India. So we are not that bad. So they, we have six in front of us, but it's going to be very, very, very complicated to, to, to get close to them. Thanks very much. We will move ahead in our, in our topics here. And, and before asking, you know, one political question, I'd like to introduce a completely different question, but, but that that comes from Nepal, actually, from Yutsu Sharma. She is a writer there. And Yutsu Sharma from Kathmandu is asking if His Excellency has an historical bond to share about Nepal and Spain. I think it's a difficult question one. Historical bond between Nepal and Spain. I don't know of any. No, uh, not, not. Not that I can recall in this moment, but uh, I'm sure that if we do a little bit of research, we will find one, but I don't have it in this moment. Maybe I can give a little, a little hand, a little help. Yeah. If there is any chance of having a historical relation between Nepal and Spain, is by a, a Jesuit priest called Antonio de Montserrat, who drew yeah. one of the first map of the Tibetan area. And I think he must have passed through Nepal because he took, he took part in the conversations in the Mughal court of Akbar in, the, in these interreligious dialogues that we're having. So maybe from that direction, from that direction, we may find one. It was a very difficult question. And just to finish this Nepal section, Ambassador, Yutsu is asking if you have any plans to visit Nepal in the near future. I think that will be a very difficult thing to do. Yeah, no, I, 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 I will. You can be, and not once, many times. I have been always very so much so welcome in, in Nepal. I have very good friends there. And mm -hmm. I was supposed to have been in Nepal I mean, at least two or three times in the last months, but now it's impossible because the, the, the borders are closed but uh, yes uh, it's a it's a country that uh, I, 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 my, I treasure the visits that, that I had there you know, in, in Kathmandu and in, in other parts of, of Nepal not many because I haven't had the opportunity it was just well, short visits but I would love to go and I will go back probably in a couple of months as soon as they open <laughs> that's a very good 
it's really a, a, a lovely and beautiful country. I'll, I'll take now a, 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 an interesting question I think that our students would like to know. It's again from Smita Sahay, and she's asking, you know, um, um, how the common, um, he says, the common citizen of Spain is an active participant in the democratic process. And how, do, how does the common citizen of Spain of today view his rights and privilege? What political lessons can Spain and India learn from each other? So she's asking about democracy in Spain and how the citizen of Spain lives the, a modern, in a modern and vibrant democracy as it is in Spain and what India can learn from me to Mr. Uh, oof, what can I say? <laughs> uh, it's, a, it's a quite complicated uh, situation of, of um, in fact, in, in Spain is in fact a country which is absolutely democratic country. We are reaching uh, levels of liberty uh, uh, that uh, were absolutely unknown uh, 30 years ago or 40 years ago. And probably is one of the uh, most liberal and most democratic countries in the world. It should be in the top 10 uh, for sure, no? uh, which, uh, which is extremely positive. Uh, you can say anything you want. Uh, you can uh, against or in favor of anything and uh, your, your uh, voices uh, and your opinion is respected. And uh, nobody can do anything uh, to you because uh, liberty of expression is, uh, freedom of expression is sacred. Uh, but uh, this, if I have to put a question mark is that uh, more and more you, we, you see, not only in Spain, all over the world, multinationals and media that have an extremely powerful uh, strength to pass messages, to pass communication, to pass ideas that uh, in a way can distort the uh, opinion of many people in the country. In, in my country and in many other countries, no? uh, it's, it's, it's fake news and it's another hundred things that, 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 that that happen now all over the world. No? Influenced by foreigners, influenced by locals, but it's true now also that uh, people, uh, how would you say milita? Uh, people uh, mm, are more followers of newspapers than political parties. Uh, they really believe what this new paper said and this other paper, and this is uh, this can even change uh, 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 the voting ideas in some occasions. No? So that's uh, but it's impossible to avoid. Uh, and uh, I really don't know uh, if there is any solution to that. Uh, I think not. I think not. But the only problem is the risk of manipulation of the media. That's probably the highest risk that I see in our democratic system. But as you say, that's a, I think it's a global phenomenon. It's happening in many, in many countries in different ways. But as you say, Spain has a very vibrant democracy and a very strong civil society. And, and we know, um, I think that answers your question. Let's move now. And as you may imagine, Ambassador, there are questions about the COVID situation. This is one of the main topics of, of our present. So I would, I would like to say that how is Spain dealing with the present COVID-19 crisis? After a difficult start, it seems that now it is quite under control. There are any scope for using this to intensify relations with India? Uh, well, uh, it's very difficult to say anything about COVID and especially any, <laughs> to say anything about the future of, of uh, the pandemic and the pandemic of, uh, of COVID. No? Uh, in fact, nobody, predictions are for impossible. Nobody knows uh, if we are at the beginning or at the end of the pandemic. Everybody knows that it has our way of life. Uh, this thing that they call the new normal, which I don't like at all, 
because <laughs> if it is normal, it's not new, and if it is new, it's not normal. No, yes, but sure. both things together is something. It's more a new reality that we have to live with, and <clears throat> it's a storm that is affecting all of us. But not, we are not all in the same boat. We are in different boats, but the storm is affecting every country, everybody. How are we going to, to get out of it? I, 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 I tell you, I, I really don't know. They are, the, the, the World Health Organization is telling us that probably two, three years we have in front of us to deal uh, with, with COVID. Uh, now we are seeing that some vaccines are in the newspapers and probably uh, my belief, but this is not a medical, but my belief is that the virus is going to weaken with time. And uh, the, the, uh, it's not going to be as mortal as it has been at the beginning. Probably it's going to, in, in a few years, probably it's going to turn into something similar like a flu. Uh, but till it happens, and I don't know if it's going to happen or it's not going to happen, but uh, till it happens, uh, we are going to live in a completely different life or our life is going to be completely different. This uh, social distancing, this uh, teleworking, uh, this new way of communications is going to change tremendously the relations between people, between countries, uh, even even trade and economy, because I mean, companies, people working for the companies are not going to travel as much as they were traveling before because of the potential risk. So uh, using uh, online communications is going to be like, like now with Zoom, it's going to be uh, the way of, the normal way of working in, in few years uh, and probably uh, for example uh, nothing to do with it but you see all these uh, huge companies buying in into uh, mm, uh, the, the mm, online networks in India like uh, uh, Ambani's uh, telecommunication, telecommunication uh, Facebook everybody's buying there because it's a huge market of 800, 900 million people, and uh, online show, uh, online buying is going to be increasing tremendously. Now I think uh, India buys online like 55 percent of the total sales, and probably it's going to go to 20 or 30 percent. Which, in terms of in terms of of of, of uh, money flow, it's going to be amazing. No? So these these things are going to change with COVID or without COVID. We have, I think it has been accelerator of the process moving online. On. That's, yeah. uh, that's uh, what I can say about uh, um, our, our, our predict. But uh, uh, if you tell me, I think India uh, will suffer as Spain. Uh, probably the GDP in Spain will, will drop between 10 and 15 percent. And India probably less than that. Uh, but uh, as I tell you, uh, Spain is much more dependent on, on uh, foreign uh, income, like tourism, uh, uh, which uh, this year is uh, non-existent, no? and represents uh, incomes of 70 or 80 billion, billion dollars a year. So this is going to be seriously affected, 12, 13% of the GDP. India, as I told you before, uh, has more, uh, uh, is relying on the internal demand, and the moment this changes, uh, it will recover faster than us, surely. Very good. And as I told you, I have here several questions re regarding COVID, and I am packing them together. You already answered, for instance, the question that put Mitali from New Delhi, saying how tourism will be affected by the COVID crisis, more or less you and Mital is also asking you if it is true that Spain is opening their borders to travelers soon. Is that if we are going to see an opening of borders in Spain, we're going to see tourists from other countries soon there? Uh, 
uh, there has been a, a decision by the European Union to open borders on the 21st of June, uh, but this is going to be only for intra uh, uh, intra European Community uh, movements, not from third country states. No, so for the moment, uh, people from area will be able to move around with with uh, quite a big uh, liberty of movement, not from outside. Uh, there is no a, not a, a date fixed to open, for example, the consular sections of the embassies, because uh, this also limited by the possibility of taking an international flight or not, which is not happening now in India. So uh, there is no point of, of starting uh, to issue visas, for example, uh, when people cannot fly, uh, uh, because uh, if they expire, that, 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 that's, that's, that's damage. So uh, this, is, uh, uh, this is something that uh, I cannot tell now when people in India are going to be able. We are going to open the, uh, for, for special problems like uh, family reunion or family problems or business, uh, something which is, but not just for tourism. I think tourism will have to wait a little bit, no? I don't know how much, but uh, the, 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 the civil aviation in, in India was talking about opening the skies before uh, end of, uh, before uh, the beginning of August. Let's hope that that it turns into reality no because uh, <laughs> i don't i cannot tell you exactly uh, how the situation of, of of the pandemic will be evolving in in india or will be evolving in other countries or if in those countries which is almost gone is going to come back again as many people are, are, are saying uh, and as we have no clue about the future is it's very difficult to make any prediction i think nobody has the answer to that ambassador really it's, uh, there are certain times you wouldn't know but i just want you to reflect you know because this question keeps coming again and again and about tourism in spain i would like to mention the, the name of the people just because we have jackson suvedi he is from nepal he's the director of uh, a Spanish and, and language center there, and he's just putting the same question, which of course you don't have to answer again. And we have people like Pranay from the University of Amity in Noida, asking also a similar question, but with a different, a different angle to it, that perhaps you can take it, how it's going to affect um, um, job rate in Spain, the COVID crisis. I think that's also, <laughs> Difficult to say, but but the impact is. Can you can you just comment quickly about that? Uh, yeah, uh, it, uh, very seriously. Uh, the the, uh, the COVID is having a huge impact on the Spanish uh, uh, population and Spanish uh, working population. Probably uh, the unemployment rate which was around 8% is going to is going to go up till 25% uh, because again services are one of the main uh, uh, generators of income in Spain services related to tourists related related to hotels related to bars restaurants uh, areas where people gather, cinemas, and all these have been closed for already three or four months. And probably many of them will have difficulties to reopen in, in the future. Not many, but some of them- Can't hear have... anything, can't hear anything. Wait, sorry. Are you, are you able to listen to me? Can you listen to me? Hey, Oscar? Yes, yes, it's perfectly yeah. right, perfectly right. Please. Um, um, um. So, uh, 
I, I, I will send, I will send sorry, Ambassador. If you have some difficulty, please send, send a message through the chat. Don't open your mics, right? Otherwise, it will be difficult to continue. If anybody has a problem, please send, send a message through the chat. And, and our cultural manager will try to address it. Okay, can, you can continue. Oh, you, okay, you no, just, just to repeat, I mean, uh, we are going to be seriously impacted very, very deep. In, in, and uh, okay, okay. Uh, we're lucky enough to have a social security system that can provide. No sound, can't hear anything. Hello? No sound. <laughs> Please can't don't interrupt anything. all the time. I am, I am here perfectly, the, the ambassador. Check your computer. Please, do not interrupt, okay? Okay, thanks. Well, uh, okay, uh, yes, uh, I finished with it. We are going to be very affected by, by, uh, by this situation. Uh, probably it will take us three years to recover. Uh, it did not catch us in the right moment because the Spanish economy was slowing down a little bit. Almost they were, all, the, uh, all the economies in the world were just in a, in a slow down, uh, slow. And, uh, and this is going to be uh, quite, will have a, a, quite a serious impact in, in, the, in, in, in Spain, especially for workers, uh, skilled and unskilled workers. But yes, the rate of unemployment is going to, to go up tremendously. And another question which keeps coming, you know, and I hope um, it's, it's related to the COVID and that will be the last one in this topic. But of course, I mean, and I think it's also difficult, it's, it's difficult to be answered now, but basically it is because we have many students here, Ambassador, of course, students of the Spanish and indifferent. So people are worried about um, how the COVID will impact, you know, Indian students in Spain, you know, how, how that will change the whole, the whole situation there. And if they will be able to, to go there and, and, and to apply for Spanish universities. So can you just com comment briefly on that? <laughs> it's a difficult, we know, because no one yeah. has... The, well, the I tell you something. <laughs> yeah. If I would be sure to be right 51% of the times, I would be a billionaire. <laughs> so uh, it's very, very difficult for me to say what's going to happen. Uh, we are all hoping that, uh, I mean, uh, schools will have to open again. I think and universities are going to open again. Probably also there's going to be a change when many, many of the courses are going to be uh, done online so there is going to be a lot of changes probably in the way that uh, universities have been uh, during the last year so it's going to be a new type of uh, university where online courses are going to be probably more and more relevant uh, but how are they going to interact uh, I, I really <laughs> I, I, I really don't know but I hope I mean I am receiving already uh, requests from uh, Indian students uh, going to the next year, and it's going to be September, something like that, to the Spanish okay. universities. So okay. uh, they are confident of, of being able to, to be there. And uh, we are also confident that by September, uh, the, the, the amount of, of uh, uh, people who get infected by the, by the COVID in Spain is very, very reduced. Probably it's going to be something around 40 or 50 people a day, which is nothing and going down. So uh, the, the situation is quite controlled. It's quite controlled, as I tell you, nobody knows if it's going to come again or not. No? But if, if the trend goes, at it shows, then uh, we can expect a much better situation in the month of, of September. Well, that's, that's good news. Let's hope, you know, that's a really, really, because as the ambassador said, and as you may know, the situation there is improving right now. We are going back to this, as the ambassador rightly said, and we don't like also ambassador, this oxymoron, which is called the new normal, which is really bad. But as you know, I mean, 
um, most places in Spain are going back to norm to 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 this kind of normality. We are approaching our end. You know, an hour has been spent. I am really thank thankful to you. You know, because. Um, you made yourself available to Indian students, and to and and that's uh, that's a very important for us. But allow me to take one last question from Lakshay Sharma from New Delhi, <coughs> which I think it's a very interesting question, because as we know, and I will just read the question for you. And Lakshay Sharma says there is a certain emphasis on urban rejuve rejuvenation and beautification in many cities in India. I see a potential for collaboration between Spanish and Indian artists. Cities could have a mix of Spanish techniques in art down from the Renaissance and Indian aesthetics, not just artists. Basically what he's saying is that as you know, Spain did a lot of work in, 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 recover, in recovering he cultural heritage from all cities. And as many travelers know, Spanish cities are very beautiful now, be it Salamanca, Toledo, Madrid, Barcelona, Avila. We did a great job, no? Do you think that there is scope from, for Spain, you know, to help India in preserving its cult cultural heritage here in India, because we have a lot of heritage there, and Spain has gone through this experience in a very efficient way for the last 30 years. Uh, I think uh, we, we could, we could do it. In fact, uh, there are some uh, uh, collaborations going on between uh, what, what they call sister cities. Uh, uh, so, uh, Ahmedabad, uh, Medabad with uh, Valladolid and there are other cities and they are exactly promoting uh, the rejuvenation or, or, or the recovery of many uh, monuments. I've been traveling around India and uh, I've seen the magnificent history and magnificent buildings that India has all over the, all over the country. And uh, I was surprised by the lack of care of the people about these beauties. No? It was something that has been there forever and uh, they, they were just uh, treating this building as any other building. And I was really surprised about this, this, this way of, of uh, behaving. Uh, but uh, uh, India is so extremely rich that it's going to be almost impossible to recover all the beauty, all the monuments that this uh, country has. Uh, probably we have to limit ourselves of, to the best examples of architecture, of design, uh, in even recovering uh, any type of uh, historical uh, uh, site uh, that, that we would like to be preserved for many, 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 many years. No? And we can cooperate. I've been cooperating with, uh, uh, not related to that, but I've been cooperating, trying to cooperate because, I mean, uh, doing things uh, is quite complicated. In, 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 uh, I was trying, for example, to recover the Yamuna River for Delhi. And was, was, yeah. was, uh, I've been three years fighting for it, no? We have done our studies. We have done studies to recover monuments, uh, to recover roads, to recover, uh, to, to, to bring back the river to the, to the cities and stuff. But uh, our advance has been very, very limited. Uh, probably because uh, still today, uh, the Indian administration is very complicated. And if you want to deal in Delhi uh, with the river, just to give you an example, there are 27 bodies or 27 administrative uh, agencies dealing with the river. Not one, not two, 27. It's impossible. It's impossible to do anything if the management uh, is, is so, uh, 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 I mean, uh, uh, one part of it belonging to the municipality, another group of uh, companies or, uh, belonging to 
uh, the state and other belonging to the central government, put them all together has been really impossible for us. But still try, because uh, we believe uh, that uh, that would be an amazing, uh, an amazing uh, achievement for the city of Delhi. We try, I mean, and, and, and once you change the river, you change the city. And that's something that, uh, that we are still pushing a bit. We, we have been working with the University of Virginia. Uh, uh, we have done a five-year study, and uh, it's there and can be applied anywhere because it's a methodology. It could be applied anywhere in India or anywhere in the world. No? So uh, not monuments, but uh, I mean, uh, it's also worth to recover uh, this part of the cities. No? Wow, you are absolutely right. Rivers are the lifeline of countries and especially such a huge country as India. And, and well, I really appreciate we are just finishing Thanks again for making you available. Um, are you planning to go to Spain any soon, Ambassador? Oh. Yes, I, I wish I knew. <laughs> no way. Yeah. No way. No, no I, I don't think I, I will be able to make it probably. I, I would be lucky if I can go end of September, something like this. But, uh, no, I don't, I don't see uh, for the moment the possibility of, of, of going there. No. Well, with this, um, thanks very much, as I said, and, and, and people are very grateful to making yourself available to the students. We conclude this session here. Thanks all of you. And please um, stay with us for the next week with Uruguay on the 20th, on the 25th of, of June. Thanks very Thank much and, and, and get Oscar, a lot of music uh, appreciation yeah, and ambassador, Thank a last word. <laughs> Oscar, yeah, Oscar, let me let me just finish because I, I wanted to talk a topic that we did no, no, not have time, but I wanted just to tell you very briefly about education, saying that is for us is also one of the key sectors where Spain can have a lot of cooperation with. Uh, cooperation, in, okay. Uh, India uh, has a huge demographic. Uh, in India, 24 million people are born every year 24 million people uh, which means that uh, people from 0 to 16 uh, uh, 16 of age there are around 400 million people you have to educate these 400 million people and you have to teach these hundred million, and you have to prepare universities and, and you have to form these people because these people can rise up uh, the, the country or they can drag it down if you are not educated so uh, <clears throat> probably with new online possibilities, a lot of these people now are going to be able to access. But we are very interested in <clears throat> cooperation in this, this uh, special field. And, and we have uh, not only university, but also vocational and technical uh, training, which is extremely needed in, in India. Well, thanks very much with these comments. And, and we finish here this session today, the Spain, India, and the Spanish speaking diplomacy. Thanks very much, Ambassador, and let's meet soon. And we hope we can open our borders and get a lot of Indian tourists there. Thanks very much. Hopefully, yeah. and thank you everybody for attending this conference or, or this uh, colloquium. Thank you very much. Eh?